And more on the coronation. The Guardian reports that new anti-protest laws will be rushed through in time for Saturday. Let's talk about that in more detail. Should we join us now? Tom Tugendhat, Minister of State for Security of the United Kingdom. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. How worried about you about what happened at the palace last night? Look, I'm always concerned about security of the royal family and, of course, for a major event like this, and that's why we've spent quite literally months planning it. And I'm very glad to see that the police reacted incredibly quickly, incredibly professionally to the incident last night. We're in no way complacent, uh, and I'm very, very proud of the response that uh, the police have done. The intelligence services, the police and others have been working on this extremely effectively for months. What can you tell us about what happened? You're going to understand there's very little I can tell you other than what you've already reported, which is that uh, an incident occurred last night. Some shotgun cartridges were thrown into the palace grounds by uh, an individual, and that individual has now been arrested. Um, pretty stupid, given how many police are on the streets at the moment. How much is um, security costing us for the coronation? It's very difficult to pull that out as a separate figure for the simple reason that we've got an enormous amount of uh, effort going in uh, for a major incident like this in different parts of the country. Uh, because there's people getting together in streets, there's people getting together in gatherings across the country, which, because, because this is a moment of national celebration. What I think is worth looking at, though, is how much this is bringing to the country. If you look at the number of tourists who are coming, the number of the amount of attention that's coming, and indeed, I hope, the amount of business that will be generated by heads of state and government and other business people coming to uh, the United Kingdom at this time to see what we offer. And this is a fantastic moment to showcase the United Kingdom to the world. Um, figures of at least 100 million just for security. Is that a figure that you recognise at all? It's not a figure I recognise, sorry. No. So it's not going to be that much? It's, uh, look, it, it's very difficult to pull out these figures because... Uh, on no, a... but the, the government is paying for it, and uh, thus we are paying for it as taxpayers, so they want to know how much it's going to cost. And it's a perfectly reasonable question, it's... Kay, and forgive me for, for not being able to break it down at this point. The reason I don't want to do that is because there's police forces around the country who are doing different things and answer slightly differently through their own uh, different structures. So the police service in Northern Ireland, for example, which is going to have to do a lot of preparation at the moment, doesn't answer through the Home Office, answers through the Northern Ireland Office. Police, service, uh, police Scotland answers through the Scottish Government, as you know. So these are just slightly different ways of calculating it. I'm sure we'll be able to come up with a number, but I don't have it uh, at this time. Do you know how much it's costing the Met? Uh, we don't have that number now because I haven't been collecting it. What I've been doing is making sure that the Met are ready, and that means preparing with them and the National Crime Agency and the intelligence services to make sure they have all the resources they need. Who are they most concerned about? Um, I'm seeing that uh, Simon uh, Morgan, who's a former Royal Protection Officer, suggesting that the biggest threat is homegrown with people like Extinction Rebellion, Just Stop Oil, suggestions that they're going to throw rape alarms at uh, parading horses, which seems pretty ridiculous. So, uh, first of all, you'll understand, I, what I don't want to do is to encourage anybody or give anybody ideas, so I'm not going to highlight individuals. What I would say, though, is that we have spent an awful lot of time over the last several months preparing for any number of different threats, because the reality is this is a very complex event. First of all, as you know, there's the uh, parade down the Mouths, which is relatively contained. Then we've got the uh, concert in Windsor. And then, of course, we've got events around the country. I don't know, don't know about you, but I'm going to be at a street party on Sunday. Uh, and there are many different ways in which we're looking to make sure that people and communities around the country are absolutely safe. And what would you say to those groups um, that are potentially considering trying to disrupt events by throwing rape alarms at uh, parading horses? So I'd say to anybody who's thinking of uh, doing anything like that, think of your fellow citizens. Think of your friends, your family and your neighbours. Think of what this is about for many, many people. This is a moment when the country can come together. Whether you're a royalist, whether you're not, this is a moment where you can celebrate uh, the family, the community that you're in. You can celebrate uh, what it means to be British in, a, in an open, in a, in, a, in a caring way, and make sure that you're there for each other. I think this is a huge opportunity for the country, and it's a major moment for us to come together, and I think that's something to celebrate. Our uh, post bag is absolutely uh, brimming with people saying that, they, that Camilla is not their queen. What would you say? Well, I'd say it's not for me to choose who the king marries, uh, and the king chose to marry uh, Camilla, and so I respect his choice, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting her one day as queen. Are you going to be? In, are you going to the Abbey? I'm very lucky. I have been invited. Yes. You are lucky, yes, actually. Only two thousand or so, as opposed to eight thousand back in 1953. Let me move on to um, Sudan. More rescues today. We're told more airlifts today. Um, 
Are we too little too late? No, we're not. Uh, this has been the longest uh, and the largest rescue mission by any Western country. I think I'm going to get the figures slightly out, but I think it's about 2,300 people have been airlifted out. There's another flight today from Port Sudan. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, the Ministry of Defence and the Foreign Office have done an exceptional job in responding very quickly to what turned into uh, a crisis very uh, surprisingly at a moment when we thought peace talks would take off, but they didn't. Now what's happening is the Foreign Office are devoting huge amounts of effort to making sure the ceasefire, such as it could be, uh, is re-established and uh, with any luck we're able to deliver a safer outcome for everybody in Khartoum and Sudan. And those who are not lucky enough to be able to be airlifted out and find themselves on a small boat um, crossing the channel, what should happen to them when they get here? So there are already many who've come from Sudan through different resettlement uh, schemes that are lawful and legal. Family resettlement, the Sudanese community in the uh, UK is the one of the largest to use the family resettlement scheme. And there's also the UK resettlement scheme, which uh, in previous years has taken UNHCR resettlement. So there are legal ways in which those who have a justified reason for asylum in the United Kingdom can take it, and they really should not uh, be empowering people traffickers or organised crime groups by using uh, illegal means. Of course, it's not illegal, though, is it? Well, the organised crime groups that are operating... That's illegal. That is Crossing illegal. the channel on a boat is not illegal. But it is uh, wrong to subsidise or support in any way organised crime groups, and I don't think any of us would support the idea that we should have organised crime groups profiting from human misery. And sadly, that's what we're seeing in the Channel and that's what we're seeing in the Mediterranean. Well, we acknowledge it's not illegal, don't we, to well, cross the Channel we, in a small boat? What, what we acknowledge is that organised crime groups are making an absolute fortune out of human misery, and this is deeply wrong. It's a form of human trafficking that has brought misery to quite literally millions. And, you know, we see... Is it illegal, though, to we, get on a small boat and cross the Channel? OK, we see... It, it, is it, it, it or not? It's, it's not illegal to be a victim of human trafficking. Thank you. But so it it's is, not illegal. But it is illegal to, to, to transport people in a criminal way, and that's what we're seeing. OK, but that wasn't my question. And you acknowledge that it's uh, not illegal to cro cross the channel in a small boat. What about putting these people on disused oil rigs? Is that a good idea? So there's a huge number of solutions that we've got to come to, uh, that we've got to find for this, because what we simply cannot have is this form of human trafficking that is literally costing thousands of lives a year. I mean, quite understandably, Kay, you're focused on the Channel, and I understand why, because that's most, the closest area to the United Kingdom. But if you look at uh, the passage of migration through the Sahara Desert, through mm -hmm. the Mediterranean, there are quite literally thousands and thousands of bodies marking the evil of this crime down every step of that route. We have got to stop this. This is a simple humanitarian uh, emergency in many parts of the world. And we've got to make sure that people are not trafficked into this human misery. It is absolutely horrific to see what is done to some individuals who are all they're doing is searching for a better life. But what they're doing, what, what happens to them is they get sold into slavery, sold into human trafficking, uh, and many of them, sadly, are murdered effectively in the Sahara and the Mediterranean. And thus, should we put these people on disused oil rigs? Well, what we should do is stop the traffic. What we've got to do is we've got to make sure that this crime doesn't pay. And the way in which to make sure this crime doesn't pay is to make sure that there is no incentive to do it. Now, there are safe and legal routes. I've just highlighted two of them for you. Uh, there's the community resettlement okay. and there's a mandate resettlement as well. So there are safe and legal routes into the United Kingdom. These are not the safe and legal routes. OK, let me just ask you quickly before I let you go about the Ukrainian ambassador who was sat where you are uh, yesterday saying that he still wants these fighter jets. Uh, from the UK and other countries in order to try to defeat Russia. Are we going to let them have them? So Vadim Prusaiko has been one of the most effective advocates for his country. And we have been absolutely front and, you know, the forefront of making sure that he gets all the ammunition and support he needs. We've been absolutely key to huge amounts of cooperation in ways that I'm not going to discuss, but also in ways that we can discuss, things like uh, training, uh, where you see the Ukrainian forces being trained in Salisbury Plain and the weapons and ammunition going forward. The question about fighter jets is a slightly different one because it requires huge amounts of maintenance to uh, sustain a fighter jet. For every hour it's in the air, you've got to service the parts and the engines and all the different bits of it for many, many hours on the ground. So it's not as simple as simply sending over a shell or giving a piece of information or training a soldier. And that's why the complexity of this is so great. So what would be the best answer would be to make sure that they're able to maintain the jets that they already have, because they have the training and they have the experience to do that, and make sure that they're able to take on and defeat uh, the Russian forces that are attacking them. 
What we should also be doing is looking at making sure they have air defence, and that is exactly what we're doing. We're making sure that they have the weapon system that means that Russian uh, aircraft cannot attack them. And that, after all, is absolutely essential to making sure that Ukrainians are in a position to at expel Russia from their At a time, sadly, territory. so I'm going to have to let you go. Um, uh, lucky you for having your ticket on Saturday. Thank Give you. us a wave as you go in. I will do. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot, Mr Tugendhat.